Good morning. At least it's morning for me. Don't know what time you're watching this, but um, today we are going to talk about mass timber. Mass timber, of course, is, is a gigantic disruptor in our industry right now um, in a very positive way, um, in a move towards building things more sustainably and trying to, to, to take carbon out of our uh, uh, out of our construction that and that doesn't mean we're taking carbon out of construction because obviously wood is full of carbon we're just trying to to prevent the um, uh, release of carbon into the atmosphere in the form of carbon dioxide um, so what is the deal with mass timber let me give you a primer on mass timber excuse me <coughs> excuse me this um i know that i am not seriously sick but it's one of these things that that if you're sick at all gotta be home um in the in this context um so to understand what mass timber is we need to first understand what heavy timber is because mass timber is an evolution of heavy timber so what is heavy timber heavy timber has a formal definition under the building code um, NBCC says that heavy timber is defined as wood elements and heavy timber construction shall be arranged in heavy solid masses with essentially flu smooth flat surfaces to avoid thin sections and sharp projections. So what does that mean? Why, why are we concerned about that, about that as a definition? Well, the, the, um, the significance of that is all in combustibility that heavy timber is much less combustible than light wood framing. Notwithstanding that the fiber is the same, um, and I'll elaborate this a little bit more, if you satisfy this definition and some various size constraints, your building is much more fire safe. And it is deemed to have a fire rating of 45 minutes just by meeting minimum dimension. Um, so here are our, our dimensions. Our columns have to be six bys. Um, which means they have to be nominally six inches or in square at least or 140 millimeters. So nominally six inches translates into 140 millimeters, the exact dimension of a, a five and a half. Our beams meet, need to have a minimum width of 89 millimeters, so four bys. Um, our decks, our floor decks need to be uh, nominally three inches thick. Um, Sorry. Nominally three inches thick, which translates into exactly two and a half inches thick or 64 millimeters. Roofs need to be nominally two inches thick, which translates into an exact dimension of one and a half inches. Um, and I should say that, the, that where these come from is a six by six is not sawn at 140 millimeters. It's sawn at 152 millimeters. It's sawn six by six. Um, uh, but then it's planed and planing takes a little bit of off, off of every surface. So a quarter of an inch off every surface in order to get the dimensions, uh, um, true. And, uh, and so the nominal dimension is the planed dimension, not the rough sawn dimension. Um, and so, um, heavy timber, as I said, is, is deemed to have a 45 minute fire rating and I'll elaborate on why that's the case after. So if that's heavy timber, what is mass timber? Um, mass timber has no definition in the National Building Code. It has been defined in the BC Building Code, but it, it's not in the National Building Code. Um, colloquially, mass timber is a building system comprising larger engineered elements manufactured by assembling smaller pieces of sawn or peeled wood using adhesives or mechanical fasteners. Um, so if you're familiar with glue lam, glue laminated timber, that qualifies as mass timber. It's, it's nominal two bys stacked up and glued together to make a big beam. Um, in DAX, we have cross laminated timber as an example, which is two bys this way, two bys this way, two bys this way, um, stacked up and glued together. Um, but there are others, um, mega plywood, um, there is massive plywood that's made, you know, um, thick enough to, to qualify as mass timber. Fire risk resistance for mass timber is calculated by calculation. So 
it does meet, once you're mass timber, if you meet the dimensional limits of heavy timber, um, you are deemed to have a 45 minute fire rating. So heavy timber doesn't require it to be engineered sections built up and, uh, and laminated together. But if you are engineered sections that are built up and laminated together, and you meet the dimensional limits of heavy timber, you are deemed to have a 45 minute fire rating. Um, but you can also calculate the fire rating in accordance with Appendix D of the National Building Code and uh, or CSA 086 Annex B. 086 is the engineering design standard for wood. Um, when you do, when you calculate fire resistance by calculation, you can get fire resistances higher than 45 minutes. You can have an hour, you can have an hour and a half, two hours, whatever you need. You can calculate what is the fire resistance of that particular element. I thought I elaborated the, um, the BC Building Code definition. But the BC Building Code definition is, um, uh, is just a conversion of the heavy timber definition. So in uh, heavy timber, um, a beam needs to be 89 millimeters minimum width. In mass timber, it only needs to be 80 millimeters because 80 millimeters is the width of a glue lamb beam. It's a standard width. So it's kind of a soft conversion. Similarly, a, a column in heavy timber needs to be 140 millimeters. In mass timber, it can be 130 because a 130 is a standard width for a, a glue laminated column. Um, so um, there is an awful lot of uh, information and misinformation and misperception around, around wood. A lot of concerns raised about fire, about rot, about costs, code, res uh, code restrictions. So I'm going to try and address some of these now. Um, let's start with fire. Let's talk about how wood burns. Um, great quote from my pal Steve Kraft from CHM Fire. He's a fire consultant. He said, wood will not sustain combustion in the absence of a re-radiating surface. What that means is that notwithstanding... Um, uh, that the fiber is combustible. If you hold a torch to, a, to a, a wood surface, a large wood surface, as soon as you remove the torch, the wood will self-extinguish. Um, so that makes you wonder, how do wood buildings burn? If you have a corner, it'll burn along the corner because, because the, the um, radiant heat from the flame will bounce back and forth between the, the two surfaces. If you have light wood framing and you have two joists um, side by side, um, the, uh, the two joists will re-radiate the radiant uh, energy back and forth, and that will sustain combustion. But if you have a, a single smooth flat surface, it will self-extinguish. Anybody who has tried to build a campfire knows that this is the case. Um, the secret to building a campfire is you need multiple pieces close enough together that the, that the surfaces will re-radiate off one another. You cannot start a campfire even with a blowtorch. You can't start a campfire by um, applying a blowtorch to a log. <coughs> Love this image of, of uh, this is from the... Uh, San Francisco fire 1906 I think um, and this is an example of um, a post fire of a building that had collapsed and we can see the steel beams during the fire heated up to a point where they lost their stiffness and they and they ended up drooping and sagging the wood beam preserved its form you can see that it charred from the outside but it preserved its form I'm going to back up a slide here, show you the charred beam. Um, what happens when a wood is burning is it's forming a layer of char all the way around the outside. And that char acts as an insulator and protects the core. The char has no structural integrity, so to be sure the building is getting, the beam is getting weaker. Um, but we know the rate of penetration of char in a design fire, and it's about 41 millimeters per hour. So, 
if we take a beam and we start with a beam that's 200 by 300 and after an hour that beam will be 118 by 218 it will have lost 41 millimeters on all surfaces after an hour and uh, if we neglect the strength contribution of the char because it really has none what we wind up with is a beam that's got some capacity left and so that's how we we design for fire we add a sacrificial layer of wood all the way around the outside now it's not quite as bad as it sounds because in the event of a fire um, we don't design for the same loads as the building might experience so we're designing for the maximum probable load that a building is going to see during its lifetime but the probability that it will see that load during a fire is uh is small enough that we don't have to take the full load we design for the maximum load that the building is likely to see during a fire and shannon is it 75 percent At one hour, it might be 75, and in an hour and a half, it might be 50, but that even seems too high. I can't remember. It's one of those things I have to look up. Yeah, I have to look high. it up as well. I mean, you could, you could tell that... Which is why I let you guys have open book. If I can't remember, how can you? Yeah. Uh, this, is, this is a bit of a migration of roles thing. I, I don't look at the building code very often anymore. And, uh, and many of these provisions have come in since, uh, since I knew the building code well. This is a beautiful example. This is the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire um, in 1911, which was an absolute tragedy. The extraordinary loss of life in this fire. Um, but the loss of life was not due to the structure in any way, um, or at least not due to the wood structure. So lives were lost because um, uh, this was an abusive employer. They locked the doors um, and, uh, and then they didn't maintain the fire escapes. So um, there was loss of life because people couldn't leave the fire compartment and there was loss of life because of fire escape collapse. Um, but the structure performed well and you can see that in fact there is not a huge amount of loss of section on these elements. There is a little bit of loss of section but the, um, the structure remained serviceable even as many many people died in the fire um, due to other reasons. So we've debunked fire. We understand that, that buildings can be very safe in, in the event of a fire. And in fact, I didn't make this comparison but I, or as explicit as I should have. But in the absence of fire protection, if you have bare steel, wood will perform better than steel in a fire um, because, the, um, because um, without the fire protection, the steel will lose, r rapidly lose stiffness and if you lose stiffness, things sag, no problem, who cares if it sags, but columns will buckle. And, um, and that's where the, the real danger is in fire with steel. Um, so wood buildings can be extraordinarily fire safe, notwithstanding that they contribute fuel to the fire. Um, because they're contributing fuel to the fire, um, <clears throat> it's probable that there is more likely to be a total loss in the event of a fire. Um, but n no matter what, if there's a fire in a building, be it a concrete building or a steel building or a wood building, there's going to be remediation has to happen. I mean, the buildings don't just, you don't move into a building after a fire. Um, and wood is, is actually a very repairable building, more so than concrete. Um, steel is also very repairable. But Okay, so let's talk about water. Um, we can see images like this one that I'm showing here, and we've all experienced this, and, and it makes us believe that that um, uh, wood doesn't stand up to water very well. I'm just going down into the crawl space to work okay. on that. If you need me, you know where to find oh, fine. me. Yeah, you bet. I'm sorry for my snorting and coughing during this. <laughs> um, I don't know how to mute. Um, uh, so... So water, um, the one extremely important thing to think about with wood is that wood requires liquid water to decay. 
in the absence of liquid water, wood will last virtually indefinitely. Um, people talk about dry rot. Dry rot is a misnomer. Um, wood doesn't rot if it's dry. Dry rot is wood that got wet, rotted, and then dried. Um, so it's not. Uh, it doesn't rot when it's. Uh, it doesn't rot when it's um, uh, dry. So. This, the key to preserving a wood building is make sure your envelope is intact. Don't let liquid water into the building. Um, but we need to not let liquid water into the building anyway. So, so wood is no different from anything else in that respect. You've got to keep your building dry. Uh, there are some other things that we do, but, but let me just, just uh, show you this, this graph. So liquid water results in a, a moisture content of the wood in excess of about 25%. Um, and, a, and a moisture content of 25% is about when decay will, will uh, start. Um, moisture content is not the same as relative humidity. And this graph shows you that at a relative humidity of 50% and a temperature of 22 degrees, so this represents kind of a normal interior building condition the moisture content in the wood is under 10 percent um, so what do we need to get to the 25 percent well at room temperature we need a moisture content or a relative humidity of 95 percent and that's a sustained relative humidity of 95 percent in order to get the um, um, to get the moisture content up to the point where where decay will commence so what does that mean for us? Well, it means that wood is actually ideal in a pool environment um, because pool environment, high humidity, but it's high temperature. Um, it will not, um, uh, you will not get a humidity high enough to, for decay to start. Um, and also wood being, um, being a conductor of moisture. So it's got all the capillaries. Um, and having a low heat capacity means, and, and low thermal transmission means that you're less likely to get condensation in wood than you are in steel. Um, so steel, as soon as like you're a little bit above the dew point, you get condensation. In wood, you're unlike you're less likely to, likely to get condensation, and when you do, it wicks away from the site. So that little bit of water is drawn um, drawn away. Um, so wood is actually excellent in very high humidity environments like pools. So what about cost? Well, this is, this is um, a cost comparison, a study done by Hanscom, commissioned by National Research Council of Canada, to look at the comparative costs of mass timber versus structural steel versus um, cast in place concrete. Um, this was a 12-story office building. I don't remember what the square footage is, but you know, half a million square feet or something. Um, and uh, and they looked at four different um, construction types. Building one, mass timber structure, exposed mass timber structure. Uh, <coughs> building two, encapsulated mass timber uh, structure. So we can't build 12 stories exposed mass timber under the current building code but it is anticipated in, I don't know, 20, well, actually, come to think of it, it was the 2020 NBCC that was going to allow 12 stories encapsulated. So that's encapsulated in drywall for fire protection. They looked at a concrete building structure and a steel building structure. And look what we see. The most economical building um, was the mass timber building structure at $176 million. Um, the second most economical was the, uh, was the concrete building structure, mass timber falling just a hair below concrete, um, encapsulated mass timber was, was a little more expensive and the most expensive building, uh, was steel. Now, um, these were optimized designs. I don't believe that they used the same span. So they optimized... I think that the, the mass timber building was a six meter bay, whereas the steel was a nine meter bay, or concrete was a nine meter bay. So we're not really comparing apples and apples. Where's the spray bottle? It's in your uh, larder cabinet back. Um, 
So let's look at the strength of wood. Um, it's easy for us to perceive wood as less strong than steel. And in fact, wood is less strong than steel and it's less strong than concrete. Um, but it is a lot closer than you might think. Um, <coughs> so this graph here shows you the strength density. So let's take, and the stiffness density. Um, so let's take the strength and stiffness divided by its weight. And here's what you can see here. Softwood and steel actually intersect. There, if you make a Venn diagram, there is soft, like at the strong end of the softwoods, um, have a similar strength density to the mid-range of steel and a similar stiffness density to the mid-range of steel. So, so pound for pound, um, wood as, is as strong as structural steel and as stiff as structural steel. Um, so why do we perceive it as less, less so? Well, the fact is that, that wood, the weight of wood is 8% or something of, uh, of structural steel. So dramatically lighter, um, and this is strength density. So, so where, where steel might be 20 times as strong and 20 times as stiff, it's also 20 times as heavy. Um, um, but the amount of material, the, the strength per amount of material is, is, uh, um, is comparable. Look at this, the strength density and stiffness density of concrete is way down, it's the worst. Because, not because it's not strong and it's not stiff, it is strong and stiff, but it's very, very heavy. Um, to, to put it in context, you know, um, concrete has a tensile strength, a usable tensile strength of zero. The actual tensile strength might be around two MPa um, and, uh, and a usable compressive strength of say 30 MPa. Um, wood, you're looking at about 23 MPa compression and tension. Um, so wood is really very comparable to concrete. It's a little bit less strong in, in compression, but it's, um, it's stronger in tension dramatically um, and comparable to reinforced concrete in, in, uh, in tension. This is, I always find interesting. Look at hardwood here. Hardwood is worse than softwood. That doesn't make sense, right? Well, the fact is that hardwood is a lot heavier than software, softwood. So the strength dens density is lower even if the strength is higher, just like concrete. So wood, extraordinarily strong material. Where does the weakness of wood come from? The weakness of wood comes from the flaws in the wood. Um, so you get shrinkage checks. Ch check is the long crack you'll get down a beam, um, an old beam. It's not, it's not there when they mill it. Um, but as it seasons and shrinks, you get differential shrinkage that'll cause some cracking. Um, knots. Um, the strength of wood is parallel to the grain, not perpendicular. And, uh, and so if you have a knot, you have grain that comes along, hits the knot, has to stop. Because in the knot, the grain is running this way. Um, so a knot is a weak point. As much as the knot is the hardest part to split, it's hard to split because the grain's going in the other direction. Um, but from the strength of a beam, a knot is problematic. Um, other things you get, uh, you get wane. Wane is a bark inclusion. That is where, where they saw a beam out and, and a corner of the beam was at the edge of the tree. And so you get a, what's called a wane. You get a little bit of bark, um, reduces the size. So it's the imperfections in the wood that reduce its strength, which is the reason why engineered wood is dramatically stronger than sawn lumber. Um, because in engineered wood, you don't have imperfe imperfections. You cut it out, you throw out the bad piece, you glue, out, glue together all good pieces. And, uh, and, it's, and um, your strength is, is almost equal to the fiber strength. So what about building codes? Well, here's two projects that my office is working on right now. 77 Wade. <coughs> Excuse me, and the academic tower at U of T, seventy-seven Wade, is eight stories, about a hundred thousand square feet, um, and uh, um, largely exposed mass timber. What the building code allows us to do is six stories, in a much smaller area. 
Um, but Wade has been approved for construction. Um, we don't, I don't think we have a building permit yet, but we have the um, but the um, uh, the alternative solution has been approved um, because they were able to quantitatively do a risk analysis that demonstrated that this was as safe as uh, a comparable concrete building. So what are the, some of the, some of the things that they do? Well, you you have a high fire rating. So maybe the, as a, in a concrete building, they would require a one hour or one and a half hour. At 77 Wade, we have a two hour fire rating between floors. So you have a higher fire rating. Um, you build your, your cores non-combustible. So your, your vertical cir circulation elements are non-combustible. Uh, you pressurize your cores so that so that you can't draw smoke into the uh, core. Um, you have alternative um, water source for sprinklers. So that improves the reliability. So there's a whole lot of things that we can do to wood to make it safer and to demonstrate that it, it, um, its performance is comparable to, to things that are allowed under the building code. The academic wood tower at U of T, um, alternative solution has been submitted. And um, and I believe the the alternative solution for fire has been approved. Um, we haven't received uh, the alternative solution approval for the structure yet. Um, but this is also a, a mass timber largely exposed. Where the mass timber is not exposed, it's not concealed for fire protection. It's concealed because we need acoustic mitigation elements. So so we can go using the alternative provisions alternative solution provisions in the building code we can go beyond the um, um, beyond the prescriptive limits of the building code um, we're early days on on a few pie in the sky projects one is a 30-story residential building one is a 20-story office building um, and um, you know where the the owner is comfortable enough um, that they're proceeding notwithstanding that we're really stretching well beyond um, the prescriptive limits of the building code. So these are the prescriptive limits. OBC 2012, which is our governing building code right now, allows six-story wood frame not restricted to wet to mass timber. That can be a light wood frame. NBC 2020, uh, that's the national building code, allows 12-story encapsulated wood. Um, NBCC 2020, I don't believe has been published yet. Um, but it's imminent. Um, it'll be at least a year before Ontario adopts it, but but within a year or two, Ontario will allow, by rights, a 12-story encapsulated mass timber. Um, the International Building Code already, or 2021, um, is projected to allow 18-story encapsulated, eight-story fully exposed mass timber. Um, so the 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 uh, the building codes are getting less and less stringent, and the fact is, we're doing we're doing a, an eight story lab building right now with with nine meter spans, and the loads are very heavy, and the column size winds up being uh, beyond uh, beyond what's reasonable, and floor to floor heights are going to drive us into into other solutions as well. So, like, we're getting you know at, at these heights we're getting close to the practical limit of mass timber anyway um, because because the depth of structure will, will will be so high that we are unable to um, um, like we start losing floors off the building <coughs> because the floor 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 heights are too high the spans get small and the columns get big um, so where we're seeing the tall buildings are hybrids our 20 story and and uh, and our 30 story projects that we're looking at right now are hybrid buildings which are going to incorporate um, structural steel and mass timber together. So to talk about about uh, 80 Atlantic. 80 Atlantic is is the first I think they they're making the claim to be the first w commercial wood building constructed in Toronto in 100 years or something. And uh, you know, I'm I'm sure you can argue that semantics on that one, but but it's an extraordinary achievement, 80 Atlantic. But to give you a sense of, of what it's like working with wood, 80 Atlantic, the pro forma was nine meter bays, six stories. Um, but um, 
the member sizes were so large that they, they wound up running out of headroom. Um, and, and what they ended up building is six meter bays and, um, uh, and five stories, um, just because of the depth of structure. Okay, so, so if, we, if we debunk the, uh, the uh, concerns about um, working with wood, what are the benefits? Well, sustainability is a big one. Um, uh, wood will encapsulate about one ton of, um, of the carbon associated with carbon dioxide, or the, sorry, the carbon associated with one ton of CO2 in every cubic meter of concrete. Um, so it doesn't encapsulate one ton of carbon um, because one cubic meter of, or of wood doesn't weigh one ton. Um, but if we took um, the, the uh, one ton of CO2, the amount of carbon in that one ton of CO2 um, is encapsulated in one cubic meter of wood. That math is not exactly right. It's just easy to remember. If you, you know, it actually ranges in the six to 800 kilograms, um, but it, you know, it doesn't matter. It's one ton per cubic meter is good enough. Um, and, and unless you're doing an LCA of, on your project, and then you want to be more precise than that. Um, it's been said that the best thing we can do is to preserve the forest through responsible management while harvesting as much wood as sustainable for the production of dot, dot, dot construction products. So what it was saying is, is long life products. It doesn't help us at all to make paper. Um, even though paper encapsulates one ton per cubic meter of paper, um, that carbon at the end of life of paper winds up in landfill, it winds up burned, and when it winds up burned or in landfill, that carbon is re-released into the atmosphere and makes the carbon dioxide. So what you need is to encapsulate the carbon in something that is going to be there longer than the tree would have been there. Um, or it actually doesn't have to be there quite that long, but but it has to be in there for a long time for there to be a benefit. The reason it doesn't have to outlast the tree is that a new tree grows. So, um, uh, so the, the accounting is a little bit complicated, but there is a duration that it has to be encapsulated in order to be beneficial. And if it just winds up back in the, um, um, back um, out of use, it winds up back in the atmosphere as CO2. Um, sustainability, long life, loose fit, low energy are the pillars of sustainability. Um, so we want buildings that will last a very long time. Loose fit is really important. This is a building, a picture taken of an eight story building on Spadina. That's a mass timber or a heavy timber building. It's a brick, brick and beam loft, um, built in 1895. So 125 years old. Um, and, um, uh, it has... It's still in service today because of this loose fit philosophy. That it's a very simple 16 foot bay, very regular, which means that it has gone through multiple lives. It's been, I think it's been a residential loft. It is currently office loft. It has been manufacturing. It was probably built for manufacturing for the garment industry. So um, the loose fit allows it to be repurposed for, for uses as the, uh, as the, um, community changes around it. A study in Minneapolis of demolished buildings showed that wood buildings were typically significantly older than steel and concrete buildings at the end of life. <coughs> <coughs> because they were more likely to be repurposed for other things. So let's talk about our uncomfortable relationship with concrete. Um, concrete Saskatchewan describes concrete as versatile, long lasting and durable, a cost effective and sustainable choice. Um, the Guardian descri describes concrete as the most destructive material on earth. Let's try and unpack that. Oops. Well, one is CO2. I mean, the, the, the production of cement um, is, um, is responsible for something like 8% of the total CO2 emissions in the world. 
So um, it's a it's responsible for a tremendous amount of environmental carbon dioxide, which is, of course, a green cal- greenhouse gas, which is a tremendous problem as well. Um, that said, um, recalcification, recalcination techniques are are coming like carbon cure are coming in that will re-encapsulate CO2 into concrete. And if that if it does that, that would be a miracle. Um, and I think it will. Um, so it's a matter of time. But but currently, the current concrete that we use is tremendously destructive. What about sand? Sand is kind of un is the is the kind of unknown impact or, or um, especially in Canada because we have access to lots of good sand um, concrete cannot be made from windborne sand which means you can't harvest sand from the desert um, to make concrete because it uh, it blows around too much it tumbles over itself and winds up like little spherical marbles that don't interlock and uh, and so desert sand wind sand doesn't make good concrete. You need water sand. It has to come from from water sources, which means that that sand is dredged out of rivers, which would at um, um, a, a tremendous environmental impact. It silts up the waterways. It destroys aquatic life. Um, it's harvested from beaches. So beaches are ruined because of concrete the sand that's taken for concrete. Um, sand is shipped all the way around the world. There are projects being built in in the Middle East. Um, with sand that's imported from Australia, which sounds insane, right? Middle East, you'd think they have lots of sand, but they don't have sand. They don't have the sand that's suitable for construction, or not a lot of it. Um, there are, there are, is organized crime. There are worldwide car- cartels. Be- people are being murdered over sand, and we use so much of it. This image shows that that we uh, place enough concrete in a year to build a wall 80 feet tall and 80 feet wide around the equator, um, all the way around the earth. Just a, an extraordinary amount of uh, concrete that's being used. Um, so we need to do everything we can to reduce that. Carbon capture is a tremendous, or recalcination is a tremendous uh, benefit to reducing greenhouse gases. Um, but reducing the amount of concrete we use is is got to be high on the priority list um, because of greenhouse gases and because of sand um, and uh, um, so things that we can do to do that well one is if you can build a building in wood build it in wood now th- there are only so many trees on on the earth you can imagine if, if you're going around the, the equator with an 80 foot by 80 foot wall you cannot you cannot build all those buildings in wood. We don't have enough wood. So we build as much as we can in wood. Then in concrete, we need to reduce the volume. So, so technologies like bubble deck, um, which casts um, uh, big, rigid plastic balls into the concrete are tremendous, um, uh, tremendous for reducing the volume of concrete. Bubble deck alone, with no architectural compromise, will reduce the concrete in, a, in the, the building slabs by 30%. Um, and in fact, the Daniels building uh, employs bubble deck. Silicosis is a chronic non-malignant lung disease caused by inhalation of the dust of silica, a mineral that is part of sand, rock, and mineral ores. So silica, sand is basically silica. Um, and... Uh, um, and so working with concrete exposes you or, or make, puts you at risk, risk for silicosis, whether it's in the manufacturing or on site, just anywhere there's dry concrete, uh, there's concrete dust and, uh, and puts you at risk for silicosis. Um, and you guys wouldn't have been around when, when, um, when people realized that asbestos was a carcinogen, um, but asbestos was everywhere in dust form. You breathe it in, you're at risk of lung cancer. Um, silicosis is non-malignant, but not, notwithstanding, it tr- causes tremendous health problems. Um, compare that to, to construction in, in wood. Construction in wood is fast, quiet, clean, and warm. So fast, um, this is an image of the Brock Commons building in BC, 45, 18 stories in 45 days um, is, is the time that it took to erect 
uh, Brock Commons. It's quiet. It's it's a less noisy. The 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 only noise really you're, all the the fabrication in mass timber is done in a plant. So you're not running saws on site or not very much. Um, the the noise. <laughs> <coughs> Excuse me. The noises from impact drivers and things like that. It's hand tool noise. It's clean. Um, concrete is dirty, right? It's a it's a it's wet muck that gets poured, and uh, so you get wet, dirty puddles, and and then you get dusting of concrete as it cures. Um, wood is not like that. We associate wood construction with mount, mountains of sawdust. But those mountains of sawdust don't don't show up on site. Those are all in the manufacturing plant, where they are um, collected in a controlled environment and repurposed for cogen or whatever they they do with them. Um, it's also warm. That's strange, right? It's not a heated building. Why why would I say it's warm? Um, but you know when you sit beside a window in the winter, <coughs> you have a radiant cooling effect. That is that, that the, the window, it's not radiating cold at you. It's not reflecting warmth back. Um, and, uh, and so hard surfaces like concrete, like glass, will absorb the radiant heat that your body is losing and not reflect it back and make it feel cold. Whereas wood doesn't do that. Wood does reflect it and it doesn't absorb it. Um, and so a wood construction site... Is a, is a warmer place to be, even if the temperature is just as cold. So what that translates into is a happier, more productive workforce, ultimately. Um, uh, there is a benefit in working in wood buildings as well. So, and th these are, you know, this has been studied, um, that, that working in a wood building um, has been linked to increased productivity, reduced absenteeism, and generally happier people. Um, and this is generally associated with biophilia. Although this, this, people don't talk about this radiant cooling thing, but I think there's probably a little bit to that as well. Um, but biophilia is the urge to affiliate with other forms of life. People like being around living things or, or, um, or natural things. Um, uh, so it's been associated with lower stress, lower blood pressure, lower heart rate, um, the lower heart rate, this is this blew my mind. They, they studied people working, working in wood buildings versus concrete or steel buildings. Um, they saved 3,500 heartbeats per day as a result of a lower heart rate. 3,500 beats per day. That's 45 minutes worth of heartbeats um, per day. Now, can you imagine that if your heart had a finite number of beats in your life, working in a wood building would add a year to, a year to your life. Um, no, that's not the case. Feel free to go and spread that misinformation around, but it's not actually the case. Uh, but uh, the lower heart rate does does reduce. Uh, you do save 3,500 beats per day. Um, wood has also been associated with suppression of the sympathetic nervous system and reduction of cortisol, which is your stress hormone, your fight or flight hormone. Um, oops, going the wrong way here. Um, what is a hygric mass? Um, so I should define hygric, um, or I should get an actual definition of it, but what it means to be a hygric mass is that it generates a humidity flywheel effect that wood absorbs and releases moisture to maintain the environment within an optimal range. So if the, if your normal, um, atmospheric humidity is, is in the summertime is going up and down. Um, if you're in a wood building, the wood is tempering that and, uh, and keeping it within a, an optimal range. Wood is a thermal mass. Um, now, people talk about the thermal mass benefits of concrete, but, but look at the statistic here. Thermal mass of concrete, 0.875 kilojoules per kilogram degree Kelvin. Thermal mass of wood is one kilojoule per kilogram degree Kelvin. Um, the thermal mass of concrete is higher or of wood is higher than concrete. So why don't we talk about the thermal mass of concrete more or of wood more? Um, it's because wood weighs about 20, 20% 20 as much as concrete. So you get, even though the thermal mass is higher, you have, um, 
80% less mass, equivalent, uh, less equivalent mass. But it is worth bearing in mind that, that wood has a significant thermal mass benefit. Wood is also less conductive than concrete, which means that you, you, the access to that thermal mass is, uh, is, uh, is not as good. So it is better to use, if you need thermal mass, better to use concrete. But we can't neglect uh, the thermal mass benefit of wood. <laughs> now the financial benefits, well, commercial landlords report higher rents, higher quality tenants, shorter vacancy periods in wood buildings. So we're doing a, a major development downtown Toronto right now, and and um, and the developer is is came to us saying, "I want to do a mass timber building. I want to pay the premium because that's what attacks attracts the tenants that I want for my buildings." So what are the constraints associated with wood? Well, vibration and acoustics. Um, we tend to think of wood as as um, acoustically absorptive material. Um, my pal Steve Titus from Air Acoustics said, wood benefits from the effects of psychoacoustic perception. That is that we absorb, we associate wood with warm, cozy environments, and therefore we assume that, that it performs well acoustically. In fact, if we look at, at the noise reduction and coefficients for common building materials, Here's wood at 0.15. Unpainted concrete is 0.2. So wood is actually not as good as unpainted concrete. We need to mitigate acoustic uh, absorption um, or we get echoey spaces in wood. <coughs> um, we, can, we can mitigate that though. Um, so there's lots of products around that, that are made for mitigating, um, mitigating refl sound reflection. This is an example of a, of an acoustic plywood. So, um, overlapping saw cuts in one direction and the other, so that you wind up with this grid of holes and, uh, and inside there's, there's a mineral wool insulation to absorb, absorb the sound. We also have to be concerned with sound transmission. So the thing that affects sound transmission most often, um, uh, and that's the noise, the noise that is born from one occupancy to another. That's you hearing conversations from the office or the apartment above you. Um, mass is the most important thing for mitigating sound transmission. And how do we get the mass we need? Concrete is only 20% of the mass of, of the density of of, uh, sorry, wood is only 20% of the density of concrete. Wood buildings are too light um, to, to effectively mitigate sound transmission. We add mass. How do we add mass? Well, if we're exposing the bottom, not putting a ceiling in, typically we're putting concrete on top. We have to be concerned about shrinkage of wood. So here's, Here's um, some very, very simple rules of thumb. Um, wood will shrink parallel to grain about 0.1%. So one, one one thousandth of, the, of the, the dimension, a three meter long column might shrink three millimeters. Current approximation, but um, it is not especially a concern. In fact, that's a high end. I don't think it's even that much. Um, Wood perpendicular to grain shrinks about 2%. So a quarter of an inch per foot perpendicular to grain. So what does that mean? Well, if you've got stacked timbers, um, every 12 inches, every 300 millimeters of timber that is bearing perpendicular to grain is going to shrink 6 millimeters um, as it seasons, as it goes from 15% or 12% down to 8 or 9% moisture content. Um, and that really adds up. Um, imagine on a 14 story office building, how much that adds up. A 14 story building, the, the parallel to grain shrinkage, which normally we just neglect, adds up um, and becomes significant. So we have to be very conscious of shrinkage. Um, now, as an order of magnitude, it's not different from other building movements. So 
you know, the, the, uh, a beam is going to sag 20 millimeters in mid span. Um, the beam, the building is going to drift 10 millimeters per story. So it's in the range of other building movements. So we have solutions to deal with it, but we just have to bear it in mind. Um, I said wood shrinks 2% perp to grain, but in fact, that's not quite true. It shrinks about 2% perpendicular to grain in the radial direction. Um, or, um, and it shrinks, or maybe it's 1.5% in the radial direction and 2% in the annular direction. So why do we care about that? Well, you can see if we cut a board this way, that um, in the middle of the board, your, um, your shrinkage is almost completely annular, but as we get out to the edges, it's more radial and they're different. And so you wind up with boards cup and they twist and they, they bulge. Uh, and you can see the kind of um, effects we get um, uh, based on where the, the element is cut. Now, if you look at wood, you'll see a, a stamp on the side that says S dry. S dry means surfaced dry. Surfacing is planing. So they cut it when it's wet and then they plane it and they plane it when it's dry and the intention of planing it when it's dry is to minimize this effect. Um, but it's not seasoned to your home. So they surface it in the, when it, you know, it might start at 20% moisture content. They surface it when it's 12 to 15 and then it further seasons down to nine or something or under 10 in your home. So, so things do continue to, um, um, to change dimensionally. Um, we've got to be conscious of beam shadows. So when we compare a concrete building to a, a wood building, for example, concrete buildings are generally flat slabs. So share out with drop panels and capitals, but they're very shallow projections below the slab. Uh, Dermot Sweeney's office does tapered, uh, tapered uh, drop panels. All of these things, like make, by making it quite flat, uh, condos have no features, they're just flat. Um, by making it quite flat, this the um, uh, you get the maximum depth of light penetration from the perimeter, uh, from your exterior windows. Um, timber systems typically employ beams, and beams cast shadows. So you can see even when they're not exposed to direct light. So this beam, not exposed to direct light, obviously because the sun is up here. It's not sun is up here. It's not down here. And yet you can see the shadow from the beam and you can see the dramatic reduction in light from one bay to the next as a result of beam shadowing. And of course, this is what we want. Villa Madero, Alvar Alto's beautiful project. There are no features on the ceiling and so you get tremendous light penetration. <coughs> is mass timber new? Well, no, obviously. I already told you about the you know, showed you a picture of um, the building on Adelaide um, that was built in 1895. It's an eight story heavy timber building. Um, the Waterloo offices in, um, uh, for Google um, by Robertson Simmons, old uh, mass timber factory. Um, this I think was our first project uh, using mass timber, the Grand River Recreation Center uh, with McLennan Yonkons Miller was just McLennan Architects at the time. This was built in the early 80s. Um, so we've been doing mass timber and, and uh, heavy timber for a long time. Another le leisure center with MJMA from the 90s. Jackson's Triggs Estate Winery from the 90s it stands up today. It looks like a contemporary building. It's a beautiful project. Um, so this was glue lamb and steel trusses with uh, steel deck. Gothra Community Center with, with Diamond and Schmidt. Again, another 1990s project. Bird Studies Canada Headquarters, Montgomery and Sizem in the 90s. <coughs> or maybe maybe built in you know early 2000s or something. This is an interesting one. This is a, a effectively NLT, um, nail laminated timber for the floors uh, on a steel frame. So this is something we're doing today. 
um, Customs Im Immigration Plaza at, at Fort Erie. Um, we showed you this in the context of a, of a, uh, a reciprocal frame, even though this is not a reciprocal frame. Moreland's Camp Dining Hall with Shim Sutcliffe. This is interesting because it's a combination of light wood framing and, and uh, heavy timber. So the, or mass timber. The, the big trusses are glue lamb, whereas the, the glue lamb is supporting light wood um, joists and beams. Love this project from our beloved uh, Barry Sampson, the French River Visitor Center. Um, and the Niagara Credit Union with Philip Beasley. Um, also built in the early 2000s. Philip Beasley, who teaches at Waterloo. Lovely project, um, the Malvern Library with Philip Carter and Kingsland Architect. Fielding Winery was super cool. So this is this is building on the uh, on the aesthetic established at Jackson Triggs. Another Phil Carter Library, the S. Walter Stewart Library with the Spoke Trust. This is an interesting one. I'm skipping over these. I've got stories to tell about every single one of these, but I, I want to tell you this story. This is the Lakefield College School, uh, Diamond and Schmidt, um, and, uh, and they wanted an expressive structure. We sketched this thing up. It was so beautiful. You can't even tell what the structure is here. We've got a, a bottom cord on this, uh, this truss, which is a very light cable, very, very light king posts. Um, a second set of cords that, that kind of come out in this lenticular form and plan. Just gorgeous. You cannot tell because the structure is so small compared to this element, which hangs the, the basketball net or the banners or something, uh, the sprinkler pipes. Like all the, all the secondary non-structural infrastructure is so much heavier than the actual structure that you can't even see the, the gymnastics we went through in the structure. It was fun for us, though. It was beautiful. MJMA's Innisfil Recreation Center. So, so this is an example of where, where uh, mass timber was used for largely pragmatic reasons. And you can see, look at these acoustic mitigation panels here. So wood is reflective, and, and that's, an, that's significant in a pool environment. Um, and uh, um, so we've got to mitigate the acoustics somehow. Brooklyn Library, lovely project with Shore Tilby, uh, St. Catherine Aquatic Center, uh, Perkins and Will, the same team that was Shore Tilby was acquired by Perkins and Will, and this is the same team. Uh, worked on this one. This lovely dual king post tensile truss. I should say these ones, this is interesting because what we've got is these are tensile elements. In, in a reversing load, they buckle, right? They can't take any compression, compression whatsoever. So what we've got is the, the net wind uplift might only be 30% of the net downward load. And so the in uplift, the top cord carries 100% of the load. And only in downward loads is the truss engaged. The Scarborough Library with Levitt Goodman. Beautiful kind of stacked, stacked mass timber. CLT decks. And then this is the CFB board and dining facility with, with these big declined arches. Um, one of my favorites, the lo local church of the saints. This is what's called a fink truss. So in, if we squash this flat, you'd see they cross the bottom cords cross each other and there is no continuous bottom cord. They, they cross each other otherwise. And then the other thing we did is we pulled it out of the two dimensions and made it a three-dimensional network. Extraordinarily, extraordinarily complicated to, to do the analysis, but it, the resolution was beautiful. One of my favorite projects, the Redstone Winery. I, I, I keep meaning to push my partner, Christian, on how we, how we resolve these little nodes so small, so fine. But this is a, a, a CLT roof which is why it is completely flat, uh, no beams. Uh, so point supported CLT because CLT can span in two directions. Um, point supported by the, uh, by the king post in the middle. And you can see the impact of light penetration that you have for not having uh, 
not having beams. The Indigenous Learning Center at Laurentian, Diamond, another Diamond and Schmidt project. And Iroquois Longhouse with Brooke McElroy, big blue lamb arches. <coughs> this is the Ontario Place Waterfront Park with, with West Aid. These are CLT, <coughs> CLT beams for their two way spanning capability. The St. Jacob's Farmer's Market. This is a multi-story project with CLT. This is in Waterloo. I love to talk about this one. This is the Nike Crystal Coliseum. This was up only for a weekend. It was the weekend of the Tor Toronto Marathon. Um, and then it was taken down. So temporary event facility, sort of like you'd have at the Olympics. And in fact, built was built by a team that had done uh, work for the Olympics. Here's what I love about it. And this was our uh, at our initiative. Um, it's a glue lamb frame with tensile fabric on the roof. The tensile fabric is perfectly flat. Um, and um, so it, it's not form active. It doesn't have shape, but tensile fabric is extremely strong. And, and, uh, and when you stretch it out, um, you, get that, uh, you get the benefit of it being able to span. And then it's also translucent. And it's also, this thing had to be built extremely rapidly. They put the roof on in a day, um, whereas to do another type of roof, if we had done a conventional roof, we would have needed purlins, we would have needed deck, we would have needed a membrane, we would have needed something to protect the membrane. Um, so it was extremely rapid, extremely effective, and really beautiful. I think it's a, this is a, uh, a typology that needs to be adopted for a variety of buildings. And we have adopted it. So this is a project... City of St. Louis Park Arena, uh, St. Louis Park, um, Minneapolis, or Minnesota, outside of Minneapolis. Um, and we were engaged to design the fabric component of this project. So we weren't the engineers for the glue lamb, uh, but in fact, the, the glue lamb and fabric were so tightly integrated that we did a, a, uh, a second engineering of the glue lamb because we wanted to make sure that all the load paths were captured. And then we fed our analysis to the engine, the engineer record for that component. So beams and girders are obvious systems. Are there others that we need to think about? And and I'll I'll give you a spoiler. There are. We don't have to just do beams and girders. Okay. So let's look at look at this. This is probably if there was a, a ubiquitous. Uh, system in mass timber it would be this so we have deck spanning to beams beams span in the long direction deck span in the short direction um what we're trying to do gary williams once told me and and uh and it comes every time i talk about this it comes to mind he said the system with the cheapest deck will be the cheapest system um and um and that was so counterintuitive because the deck is the deck is light, simple material elements. The deck is on a per square foot basis is the, is the least expensive. Um, the reason why the deck drives the cost is because the volume of fiber is, um, is so much higher in the deck than anything else. So even though the, the, the cost per cubic meter for deck is low, the volume is high. And I should say that, that um, you know, Materials like like steel are uh, um, fabrication and erection is is a, a high proportion of the cost. Concrete certainly, like concrete materials are cheap, um, but placing rebar is expensive. In wood, it's the other the the economics are different. In wood, the um, the material cost, the cost of the fiber, is the dominant cost. So anything we can do to reduce volume of wood will make a system more economical. So if we have a system of deck and beams, running the deck in the short direction makes the deck thinner. Uh, even though it makes the beams bigger, that will be the more economical system. What about short beams, long deck? We do that. Um, we do that to keep the depth of structure shallow. Um, because the, the beam, the depth of the beam is what's gonna drive your ceiling height. So if we're constrained, if our building is constrained at height, in height, 
we want to run the deck in the long direction and the beams in the short direction because that'll give us a shallower floor. So then what about beams and girders? Well, beams and girders, we set our beam span to optimize our deck. So a floor, the minimum minimum depth thick, <coughs> the minimum uh, deck thickness is is um, uh, 64 millimeters. We know we can buy a CLT that's 70 millimeters, which would be 35 plus 17 and a half and 17 and a half. Uh, so we can get a 70 millimeter CLT. So we would we would take absolutely the optimal deck, figure out how that far that will span, and say we need beams at that spacing. Well, well that spacing might only be two meters, and you're not going to put columns at two meters. So we span those beams to girders, which span from column to column. Um, and the beam and girder is probably generally the most economical system. Um, what about two-way beams? Is there some benefit? Well, there is some benefit. Um, the deck doesn't benefit especially because the fiber only goes in one direction and the, and the deck is going to span in the direction of, um, of the fiber and its clear span is column to column. The deck is going to be column to column, column to column, doesn't matter which way you look at it. So the deck doesn't benefit from two-way beams, but the beams benefit. So you can see that each one of these beams only picks up load from one side. Um, it doesn't pick up load from this side because on this side it's parallel to the fiber. Um, so we have twice as many beams, but the load is half on those beams. Because the load is half, the beam can be shallower and, um, and that's a benefit. Um, so we've, we've um, you know, we optimize our deck, our deck has to span column to column, but we can minimize the depth of the beam. Um, the other benefit of this is space planning. So um, if you have a square grid from a space planning point of view, typically you'd run beams in one direction, girders in the other direction, and you have a hierarchy of structure that tends to orient you within your space. Um, so if you have a dominant orientation of the building, maybe that's fine. But if you don't have a dominant orientation of the building, um, then, uh, then something like this is more democratic, more democratic from an orientation point of view. Two-way point supported CLT. So much is made of the fact that CLT can, is a two-way system uh, because you have laminations in each direction stacked on top of the other. Um, the fact that it is dramatically stronger in one direction. So top and bottom laminations go this way and then the next ones go the opposite way and the middle one goes that way. Um, it is dramatically stronger in the orientation of the top and bottom laminations. By the way, you can't make it equal. You can't put bottom lamination this way, top lamination this way, um, because it will, it'll cup. Because of this tendency for wood, to shrink more perpendicular to grain than parallel to grain means that if you have an even number of layers in a CLT, you're gonna shrink more on one side than on the other and your CLT is gonna cup, so you can't do that. It's gotta be, it's gotta be uh, symmetrical. Okay, so two, two waypoint supported CLT. Well, it's dramatically stronger in one direction than the other and you can't transfer load across the panel, which means that point supported CLT really can only span the width of a panel anyway. So 2.4 or three meters, depending on where you're gonna buy it from, which is completely impractical, impractical column spacing. So why do we even talk about it? Well, we don't talk about it for a commercial office building because you need an open floor plan. You can't have columns spaced that close. But for a student residence, um, it's fine because the, the uh, because the columns are all buried in the, the demi demising walls between the uh, residential units, which is why Brock Commons was built this way. Um, for certain areas in buildings, Michael Green um, and uh, uh, Eric Karsh at Equilibrium, brilliant guys, um, what they do in a commercial office building is they orient their beams, well, it doesn't even matter which way they orient them, but they orient them perpendicular to the core but they have a very short bay immediately parallel to the core. 
Um, and they do that with point supported CLT. So you have your, your, your stair elevator core, you have a 2.4 meter bay, and then you have a long meter, a long bay. And they do that because around the core is dominated by circulation anyway, so the, beam, the columns don't get in the way. And now they don't have to have beams between the core and the, and the column, which means you've got this core, this circulation area for mechanical. Um, and they, so they do that with point supported CLT. It's very, very clever. Two-way point supported CLT with TS3. TS3 is a timber adhesive that allows you to butt glue um, timber and develop the full capacity. Never seen it. It sounds too good to be true, but, um, but I gather that it's, it's tested and it's being done. So with TS3, you could potentially have true two-way, uh, a two-way system without um, dropped beams. Um, if we're concerned about depth, we can use wide flat beams. Um, so we don't need deep beams. Wide flat beams can be strong and stiff. It's less efficient to be wide and flat than it is to be narrow and deep, which means your volume of timber is going to go up. But it's going to go up as your headroom decreases, so um, or as your headroom increases, as your floor to floor height decreases. So wide flat beams are a valid benefit. Um, I should say that they don't help your deck. So intuitively, you would think your deck spans from here to here, but in fact, the deck spans from column to column. So why is that? Um, it's because if you load the edge of your wide flat beam, it'll topple over. You can't. So the load from your deck has to come concentric on the wide flat beam to keep it from toppling. If we have a raised floor system, we can put wide flat beams on top instead of down below. And this has the benefit of eliminating light shadows, which is not an insignificant benefit. <coughs> um, has a benefit from a space pro programming point of view because you, you don't get oriented or, or boxed into, into or um, layout by orientation of beams. Um, but you do have to build up the space in between the wide flat beams. And like, uh, like wide flat beams on the bottom, with wide flat beams on the top, um, uh, you've got to hang the deck at the center line of the beam. Excuse me, I have to stop here just for a second, but I'll stop and start again. Okay, I'm back. Uh, so wide flat beams top. Again, it's similar to wide flat beams bottom. Keeps things shallow. Deck has to span column to column. It's not, there's no benefit to the width from a deck point of view. Oh, I'm going to click over here. There we are. What about wide flat beams flush? Um, wouldn't that be nice? Because now if you've got them flush, the, the overall system is very shallow. It's as shallow as it can be. But also the deck is genuinely shorter. It goes from face to face. So you optimize your deck sections. Um, the trouble with this is it's vulnerable to toppling over of the beam, as I mentioned. So the... the uh, if you're doing wide flat beams flush, we need wide, wide columns. Um, they've got to be wide enough to, to uh, prevent the beam from toppling over. And this is a variation on the system that's being used for the, um, uh, for the arbor, for George Brown. Um, I think I referred to Brock Commons as the arbor before. Brock Commons is the, the student residence of BC. The Arbor is the George Brown pro project um, with Moriyama Tashima, uh, Fast Enough Engineering. So they did a variation of this. Now there's a little more complicated because it's, it's actually composite with concrete. It's not, um, it's not just wood, but, um, um, but it's, it's this general idea. So wide columns to prevent the toppling over. Then we've got an, a, a range of options available to us in double beam systems. So why would we, we do a double beam? Well, for one thing, I talked about the shrinkage perpendicular to grain. 
That's a real problem if we stack structure. If we stack a beam on top of a column, then that shrinkage is meaningful. Um, if we connect a beam to a side of a column, it's not. Um, we only have parallel to grain shrinkage we have to worry about. So that's a benefit, or at least you don't accumulate. The beam still shrinks, but you don't accumulate shrinkage. Um, the trouble is if you connect it to the side of the column, you can't do a cantilever uh, or you can't have continuous spans. And having a beam that's continuous over two spans is tremendously beneficial from a stiffness point of view. So, so a six meter bay and a six meter bay, um, if you use one 12 meter long beam, same six meter span, it's dramatically stiffer than if you use two six meter long beams. So double beam systems have that real benefit. A disadvantage is in fire. So we have much more exposed surface, um, uh, surface exposed to fire, which means we lose more of our beam in the event of a fire, which means we have to make it bigger. <coughs> um, this is a scheme that we came up with for, for a project. Actually, this might have been our early concept for Trinity, come to think of it. We're working on the, the student residence at Trinity right now. Um, and uh, it's cruciform columns. This portion acts like a shoulder and supports the, the beam, which slips past. Um, and uh, and it's, it's, a, it's really effective. The core passes through and carries the load from above. Triple beam systems. This is a this is a system that, that my colleague Simon came up with. It's an attempt to, to get the best of both. So our two outer beams can slip past. The the column has a little tenon, which we, you can't see here, but a little tenon that goes up so that the load transfers straight column to column. It doesn't transfer through the beam. And then the center ply of the beam is um, is column to column and is non-continuous. <coughs> so it's a really nice material optimization system and also has the benefit, um, the fire benefit that we don't have exposed surfaces. Staggered deck is a system that, that um, uh, Michael Green and Eric Karsh came up with um, uh, where you, you're effective depth of your deck is the bottom of the lower panel to the top of the upper panel. So you've got a, a large effective depth even though your deck is fairly thin. So you can use staggered deck to get long spans and then you can use the space in between panels for uh, distribution of services. So electrical and I mean mechanical probably not but at least you can distribute electrical and communication in between both down below and up above and sprinklers. Um, excuse me um, voided concrete timber composite VCTC uh, affectionately known as bubble lamb um, this is something that I came up with for um, hybridizing concrete and and, uh, and wood using bubble deck the bubbles don't do anything except take concrete away where you don't need it so the, the essentially what this is is a thick topping on, on concrete deck. Instead of minimizing the topping to just what you need acoustically, make it thick. Um, so you might say, well, what's, what's the benefit of making it thick? How, does that, how is that benefiting us? Well, if you make it thick enough, then in the direction perpendicular to the wood grain, so here's a wood grain, perpendicular to the wood grain, you make a wide, flat concrete beam. So the topping is deep enough to be a beam on its own. And, um, and what that does is allows us to get rid of any beams dropping down below um, for the, the, the benefits that I outlined before. Um, we're doing a nine by nine bay with this using um, nine and a half and nine and a half, something like that. So an overall 19 inches, so 480 millimeters, 475. Uh, something like that. So it's a thick. It's overall, it's quite thick, but it's not much thicker than the depth of the concrete slab at the drop panel. So it's not significantly, it doesn't drive the floor to floor height up relative to cast in place concrete. 
um, and has the benefit of no drop beams so that the, so that the space planning is, is uh, very simple. The other benefit of voided concrete timber composites is you can make that topping as thick as you need. So for the general areas, you optimize the system. You use the thinnest um, concrete you can with the thickest wood to, to get the concrete beam just to work because what we're trying to do is minimize the use of concrete. But in the one bay that is uh, where you've got a low transfer, you've got to move a column or something, we're not introducing a steel girder we just change the balance of concrete to wood, make the concrete thicker, the wood thinner, and now we can we can tune the strength as we need it. Um, or maybe you've got an academic building with nine by nine bays typically, but you need a 14 meter bay over um, an auditorium. Well, again, you, you go with a thick uh, bubble deck and a thin, um, uh, thin timber. The concrete is doing all the work to, to do the big span, the timber's not contributing very much, but you don't have to change your system. Um, your system is still the same. We're just playing with the relative thickness of uh, concrete versus uh, wood. Your little model, a couple of models I built um, to demonstrate the voided concrete timber composite. In this case, I was assuming a nail laminated and I staggered the bottom. There's a, there's a minor acoustic benefit to staggering. <laughs> um, so I wanted to demonstrate that. This is the Pico Delta Beam. So the Delta Beam was developed for use with hollow core precast. And the idea is a box section with a wide bottom flange, the hollow core precast would sit on it. But of course it adapts extremely well to mass timber. Really mass timber and hollow core, you can substitute one for the other often. Uh, so it, it adapts really well to um, mass timber. Our project at 77 Wade uses delta beams, uh, nine by nine bay, um, relatively thin deck. Um, so very, very effective. Um, it's interesting that with the delta beam, there's actually rebar inside. So the two vertical webs of that, uh, that uh, box beam are heavily perforated so that it fills with concrete when the concrete is poured and there's rebar inside it. Um, what that rebar does is the rebar does the work in the event of a fire. The bottom flange does the work all the rest of the time, but we don't have to fire protect the bottom flange. The bottom flange is, it can turn into a lasagna noodle in the, uh, in the event of a fire. It doesn't matter because we've got rebar inside and that's protected. This is a concept, um, we had a challenge on a project to, to develop a, a, a long two-way cantilever in a thin deck with, uh, with no visible beams. And in fact, I've got images now, they're not in the, uh, they're not in, the um, um, in the slideshow, but it's the Henley Rowing Pavilion. Anyway, this was one of the concepts, is to do a stressed skin lattice, deck top and bottom with uh, two-way beams inside. And the idea is that in one direction, the deck and the lower beam are effective because that's the direction parallel to fiber. And the crossing beams are transferring shear in, in rolling shear, what's called rolling shear. Um, in the other direction, the bottom skin and the upper beam is effective and, uh, and acting composite to one another. So with this system, we can get very long spans and big two-way cantilevers with no beams. This is an image of our Virendale truss from the side. Um, we talked about reciprocal frames. We can do a reciprocal frame with the, the benefits that we talked about. The fact that it's, a, that it's um, um, long spans made with short members. It's a full two-way system, performs well from a vibration point of view. This is a Zollinger lamella, so, so I call it that because it's, it's a, it looks like the Zollinger frames, lamella frames. It's just a denser reciprocal frame uh, with the beams oriented on the diagonal instead of on the orthogonal. What would Nervi do? Well, if Nervi was doing this, he would be trying to orient his beams to follow the lines of principal stress, which we can do. This is the... the um, 
Palace of Labor in turn, these are cast in place concrete beams. Um, and the beams oriented to follow the lines of principal stress. So here's the way it works. We have, you can see that every single one of these red load bearing beams goes all the way to the column um, directly. So we don't have a stacked hierarchy. We don't have purlins going to beams, which then go to the column. Everything goes straight to the column. So from that point, it's very, very stiff. Um, we can see that, that half of our beams have a curve in them. Well, a curved beam wants to flop over and rotate um, if you load it up. So how does that carry load? Well, the reason it can carry load is because we put these annular beams in and those annular beams are just really bridging and their whole purpose is to keep that guy from flopping over. But you can see with this system that our spans are short. This is our longest span here and it drops off very quickly. So our deck spans are very short. So our deck is really optimized as well um, because every single beam has a direct load path to the column. Um, it's more rigid than a, than a stacked beam system. This is called a cassette system, um, essentially hollow box beams made of mass timber. It's a, a means of achieving very long spans. Um, just like, just like hollow core precast, the, the material in the middle is not helping us from a flexure point of view. Only the material on the, uh, on the edges are helping. So let's take the material out of the middle. And here's an example called Ligniture of a cassette system that is so clever. Um, um, we, have, we have the box beam. It's narrow with a series of webs. Um, within the box is, um, is a mass material. So this would be really just a ballast. It could be sand. It's, it's whatever is economical and massive. And this helps with sound transmission. The bottom is perforated. It can be perforated in slots. It can be any pattern of holes. And then in between these two layers of timber are, um, uh, is mineral wool insulation for acoustic absorption. So here's a system that, that gives us long spans and mitigates sound transmission and mitigates um, um, sound reflection at the same time. This is another system. Um, this is the Cree system by Romberg. And uh, I saw this published in and was kind of unconvinced. You got all kinds of stuff going on in here. You've got wood columns, you got steel beams, you got precast concrete deck. And, um, uh, and it was, I had trouble understanding how a project benefited from this. But if you can um, optimize your building to, to very regular base sizes, the Cree system minimizes all materials. So you need, you need 100 millimeters or 75 millimeters of concrete to give you the mass for acoustic sound transfer anyway. Using precast, you just take the wood out. You don't have a wood deck. You just take that mass that you have to put in there anyway and make it structural and make it span to the, um, uh, to the beams. Um, the timber beams are composite. You can see they're notched for shear transfer. Um, so the uh, concrete acts as a top cord and the, and the wood acts as a bottom cord. The, um, uh, the steel is there just to achieve longer spans. So short spans you can do with, with glue lamb, but that's rarely suits the program. And, uh, and so to achieve longer spans, you use steel as beams instead. And then to the extent that the columns aren't too big, you use wood columns. And then as, you get, as your building gets tall, you switch to steel columns. So you're mixing all the materials, but you're optimizing all the materials as well. And so from a material use point of view, it's a very effective system. <coughs> this is the Kung Holtz bow system. Um, this is stacked dimensional lumber in a two way grid. Um, and in between all of these is filled with, um, uh, I don't know what they're filled with actually. It's not vermiculite, but in my mind it's been vermiculite. It might be cat litter, um, which sounds crazy, but we're, we're after mass and, and, uh, <coughs> we're asked after mass for uh, sound to prevent sound transmission 
um, and uh, um, right. So anyway, so they fill in between all these things. The the trouble with this, it's very clever, really intriguing, but you can't panelize it. You can see that the elements are are all long elements. It has to be site built, and a tremendous amount of site labor to build something like this. Um, but very clever and, uh, and, and structurally quite effective. So then we start playing, what are some of the other benefits? Well, we can, we can manufacture CLT to give us a, a shell structure. And there, so what are the benefits of doing that? Well, the benefit of that is it allows us to optimize the concrete. So we, we put concrete where we need it and we take it and we make it very thin where we don't need it. The CLT doesn't give us any structural benefit really other than um, the fact that the manufacturing process allows us to build a complicated form. Um, but it's effectively a leave-in form. Uh, but you get the biophilia, you get your, your hygric uh, flywheel effect. So you get the secondary benefits of mass timber, even if it's not working as a structure. Um, but by, by doing this complicated form work, you're optimizing your uh, concrete, and that is a tremendous benefit. So that was a CLT shell. We can do a, an NLT shell as well. This is um, uh, because NLT, you can, set, you can set jigs. You can set your jig... Um, uh, level at one end and you can set it uh, angle at the other end and you put all your NLT on and uh, and you can create a ruled surface that's a hyperbolic paraboloid and so when you use NLT in this fashion as a form for your concrete again you optimize your concrete it's thickest at the columns and thinnest in the middle um, in response to the load domain demand now again Wood's not working for us. The wood is broken here. You don't have continuous fiber column to column. So we came up with this idea. How do we get f continuous fiber column to column and still have a, a high par uh, so that we can have a composite system? And our idea was, was if you stagger the columns, now your high par can go um, continuous column to column <coughs> and still be deep at the columns. Um, so you stagger your grid and, uh, and now we can have high power NLTs. So I wanted to look at, at what are the benefits of the various systems? And, and, uh, and I knew that fire had an impact, um, that the system that was optimal before the fire was not necessarily optimal after the fire. Um, so we did a, a study. We looked at these three systems. We said, let's look at beams and girders with CL, or sorry, um, at the top, simple beams with uh, NLT deck. We looked at beams and girders with CLT deck versus NLT deck. Um, and we looked at uh, avoided timber concrete composite. Um, Prior to fire and after fire, the optimal beams and girders with an NLT deck. NLT is better than CLT um, unless you need the two-way action. And the reason it's better is that CLT, in, in the event of a fire, you burn through the bottom layer with, with the, the fibers oriented in the strong direction. And then the next layer, the fibers are oriented in the weak direction. So the second layer doesn't do anything for you. You burn through the first 35 millimeters and you've effectively lost 70 millimeters because you don't have a fiber oriented parallel to your load until you get to the third layer of the CLT. So in the event of a fire, CLT is not very effective. Um, I mean, it's a, sorry, it's, it's effective, but it's, it's less effective than NLT because in NLT, after an hour, you've lost 41 millimeters, but you've only lost 41 millimeters and you have everything but that 41 millimeters is effective for you. So NLT, nail laminated timber, winds up being the most economical system. Um, we look at beams and girders with a CLT deck. You can see prior to fire, 
it's only a tiny bit worse than NLT because CLT is just a little bit, um, a little bit weaker and a little bit more flexible than NLT. But after a fire, you can see that there is quite a difference. There's um, in, in terms of uh, volume, it's sort of 25 or 30 percent uh, increase. Let's look at voided concrete, tim concrete timber composite. If we don't have a fire, it's third on the list. Um, fairly significantly, a 25% or 30% more fo uh, wood volume than the other two. But after 45 minutes, if you have a 45 minute design fire, it's now comparable to the system with CLT. In a two hour design fire, it's now almost equal to the uh, beams and girders. Sorry, that's my duct cleaning guy, of course. Inevitably. Um, um, if we look at beams with NLT deck, you can see that, that, um, um, that in the event of fire, it gets, it gets worse. But just beams in NLT in a two-hour fire is better than beams and girders in NLT. And then, and then the worst of all performing is beams with CLT DAC, um, which is funny because 80 Atlantic, I think, is beams and CLT DAC. Our uh, um, Shoppers Drug Mart project on Young, beams and CLT DAC. Um, St. Jacob's Market, beams and CLT DAC. So it's actually a very common way to build it. Um, but in, fa in fact, once you take into account fire, it's, a, um, it's less, less good. <coughs> <coughs> then I also did a study to look at the impact of aspect ratio. We tend to think of a one-to-one -one aspect ratio, nine by nine, 10 by 10, 12 by 12 bays. Um, we are conditioned to thinking of a one-to-one of a, a -one aspect ratio. And it's because in a concrete flat slab, a one-to-one -one aspect ratio is optimal and normal. So, so building planning, you know, architects are very used to dealing with one-to-one -one bays. It's not ideal for a stick built system. Anything where you have things that are only good in one direction and you have to stack them, um, you have to span a joist to a girder to a column, um, those things benefit from an asymmetric bay. So let's look at this. If we have simple beams and deck, um, one to one bay, 270 um, uh, millimeters cubed per millimeter squared of plan area. So that's the effect of thickness. If you, if you squash this all down into a pancake and take out the beams, you wind up with effectively an average thickness of about 270. Um, if you increase your aspect ratio to two to one, that drops to about 225. So you get about a 15% reduction and beams and girder system is similar. Um, you go from, from 215 to about 180 or 175. Um, so both of these systems, whether it's beams and deck or beams and girder, get about a 15% uh, volume material reduction benefit by changing the aspect ratio of the bay. So bear in mind, this is still as a 50 square meter bay. So we haven't changed the same footprint. We have the same number of columns. We're just arranging them differently. One column for every 50 square meters. So what are the products? I feel like I should have put this right at the very beginning of the, slide, of the presentation, but GLT, glue laminated timber, we can use it for beams or decks. CLT, cross laminated timber. You can see that we have laminations going parallel, laminations going perpendicular. Um, and NLT or DLT, which is nail laminated timber or dowel laminated timber. Dowel laminated timber is made just by drilling long holes and driving dowels, driving wood dowels in to hold it together. How tall can we build with glue lamb columns? Spoiler, not that tall. Um, our eight story lab building, we are using composite columns. Um, so this is a, a uh, typical column, five by seven meter bay, 4.4 dead, 2.4 live. So a very standard Base size, very standard, um, uh, standard base size and a standard uh, uh, loading. 
And how many story? I didn't say how many stories this is. One, two, three, four, five stories. So carrying five stories, our column size is 356, uh, 365 by 456. So this is about as big a column as, you, as you'd want to have. Once you get up to nine by nine bays, um, which is your, your kind of standard office bay, um, you're doubling the load, obviously. Um, and and um, if you're into a composite system like the, the voided concrete uh, composite, um, that drives the, the dead load up. So these are the kinds of solutions we're looking at for, um, for our lab building to, to, to keep our column sizes smaller. This is an example of what we needed to do all in wood. 940 by 1145, big columns. And, and I should say that the standard glue lamb is only made in 365 millimeter widths. So if you need wider than 365, or it's made up to 365, I should say, it's made narrower, but not wider. If you need it wider than that, you have to do what's called block gluing. So this column here is made by gluing three glue lamb columns together. This is our Trinity project again. Some examples of details. This was for a, comp a competition that we did using a built up column uh, where we have a steel core in the middle and wood on the edges. And um, the wood acts like a shoulder to pick up the beam. It's the beam seat. It also carries one story of load, right? Because the load that comes into that beam gets transferred to the steel one story down. And um, uh, which is significant. You know, on a six story building, the steel is only carrying five stories of load because the wood shoulders are, are carrying one story load. Um, and uh, um, so we optimize our wood. What we don't want to do is waste wood, right? We don't want to put wood in there gratuitously, but if we're, if we're using it to its full utilization, then, then it, it's a real benefit. So how do we do all the things we need to do in connections? Uh, my pal Simon came up with this connection for the academic wood tower. Very, very complicated, but it needed to transfer all these loads and, and uh, as well as being um, seismically ductile, which turned out to really drive everything. Um, this is an example. I think this one is, is uh, I don't remember which one this is from, but. But you can see the complicated detail with the beam seats um, machined into the ends of the, the glue lamb. Um, this is not just gratuitous. It's not, it's not a, uh, just an aesthetic idea concealing all the wood or all the, the connection, although it does look beautiful. When you conceal the connection, now the wood fire protects the uh, connection as well. Um, and, uh, and that's a tremendously important benefit. Um, you can see the stub up here, coming up here through. Um, this the uh, yeah. The, so there's a steel bearing plate that comes on on top of the beams, transfers the load from the column through the steel bearing plate onto that stub and down into the column below, so that we don't we're not transferring column load through wood perpendicular to grain. So lovely detail. This is the Brock Commons detail. Again, we can see that the that the um, point supported CLT bears on a plate on top of the column. The load from the column above does not transfer through the CLT, but transfers through the steel shoe into the column below. This is a Sherpa connector. Um, Nap makes a very similar connector. So these are off the shelf, um, fire protected, concealed connectors. Okay, I feel like I've shown you a lot of mass timber projects and, I'm, and I've also gone an hour over schedule uh, as, I, as I am wont to do. And I have to go for a COVID test shortly. Um, uh, this is our project, the Shoppers Drug Mart at, Drug Mart at Young and Charles, I think, uh, with Brooke McElroy, here's a rendering during erection, and then an interior uh, interior view of the finished structure. 
This is an interesting one because all the glue lamb is um, is um, Douglas fir. Um, the CLT is spruce. And it's just because this particular contractor had a relationship with a glue lamb manufacturer who did not manufacture CLT. So they brought the CLT in from Europe. Um, they they tried to sell this as a as a as a uh, benefit to the project, but I can tell you that architects that I've that I've talked to uh, are less in favor of it. But um, their bid was low, and and uh, they won the job, and they're great to work with. This is Timber Systems, love Timber Systems, but um, but you get what you get the material that the uh, that the fabricator can give you. 80 Atlantic, this is the Hallmark project with Quadrangle and RJC that I told you about. That pro, the uh, pro forma was a six story building and it wound up being a five story building because of the required depth of structure. Uh, but a tremendously successful project. <coughs> this is the ribbon building in the distillery district with shop architects. Um, I'm not sure what the scheme is now. We were involved for some period of time and we were looking at the Delta Beam for this project as well. Thirty-five golden, the golden nugget. This is a super cool project. So this is developer-driven, low-cost um, steel frame with NLT deck. I believe that this is kind of a, an archetypal building. Steel frame and NLT deck is a very economical way to build um, and to give you a, a a mass timber structure. And you are substituting mass timber for a great deal of concrete when you build this way. TRC head, TRCA headquarters. Uh, if you've seen in the news, TRCA headquarters is being built. It doesn't look anything like that. Um, but um, um, this was the, the um, programming and proof of concept uh, scheme. We did, we did this with uh, DTAH. Um, but our team was unsuccessful in the in the final RFP, um, and, uh, and it went to Quadrangle, I think, um, and is under construction right now. This project was the six story, the six story problem. <coughs> um, if your highest occupied level is higher than eighteen meters, then you are a high rise, and and that introduces a whole lot of. Um, a whole lot of challenges to a project. So this was really constrained by that. And we came up with, with bubble lamps specifically to address the, uh, um, the height of building challenge. Oh, ZAS, uh, ZAS with RJC. The TR we're successful in the TRCA headquarters and it'll be built soon. 77 Wade, I've showed you, that's our project. Academic Wood Tower, I showed you, that's our project with Pat Cowell. MJMA. Uh, McEwen Architecture, uh, Laurentian. So, so we, we were involved just for the mass timber. The engineer of record was Stantec from Sudbury. Um, LGA was the architect. Here's our mass timber. So really, uh, really lovely and, and really clever. This was our scheme for George Brown, the Arbor. We, we pursued that with Pat Cow and MJMA. I love the scheme, love the Arbor as well. Um, so the the MJ or the uh, Moriyama Tashima Tashima scheme is also lovely, and it's under construction. Uh, Brock Commons. So this is um, uh, might be I don't know if it's the tallest in North America currently, um, but but a really really innovative projects point supported CLT, and for a student residence that was um, uh, that was ideal or it was just fine. And here, here are a few others. So these are these are the, the Miosa Tower in Norway, Hoho Tower in, in Vienna. Some of these are get very tall. Uh, Sidewalk Labs had it been gone ahead, had um, had some very tall timber towers in in the concept. This is our project with KPMB. This is the uh, CAMH Lab building um, uh, with KPMB. It's uh, in the design stage right now. Uh, and this one is our bubble lamb or VCTC project. 
I'll leave you with this one. This is the Fogong Temple built in 1056. It's going to be a thousand years old in, in our lifetimes. Um, or maybe, maybe yours, maybe not mine. Um, <laughs> um, and uh, uh, 67.3 meters is only three meters shorter than the academic wood tower that we're working on right now, which will be the tallest building, tallest timber building in North America when it's completed. So um, just an extraordinary building. I have no idea how, what percentage of this has been, been replaced over time. But that is one of the reasons why wood is has such longevity is that um, when a when a piece when a piece rots you replace it and you can have a thousand year old building. Okay, that's what I've got for you, folks. Um, yeah, it's been a blast. Shannon's going to talk to you now. And because Dave uh, was extra extra verbose, um, I'm going to share my pre-recorded. Um, lots of things have happened here, uh, pre-recorded uh, representation of complex geometry. So I've been going to record it for you guys fresh, but the day has completely gotten away from me and I want you guys to be able to watch as much as possible during your time slot. So you will be seeing last year's recording of uh, representation of complex geometry. Okay, bye team. <laughs>